In 1935, life in the Florida Keys was a unique blend of natural beauty, maritime traditions, and a laid-back vacation lifestyle. Despite the Depression, tourists flocked to the Keys by way of Henry Flagler's Overseas Railroad. But with that tranquility comes the ever-present danger of tropical cyclones. On Labor Day 1935, that fear became a reality for tens of thousands of residents and guests of the Keys when a catastrophic hurricane struck the archipelago. Today, we are going off the radar and back in time to relive one of the most intense hurricanes in American history. I'm meteorologist Emily Gracie, and you're listening to Off the Radar, a production of the National Weather Desk. On the show, we dig deep into topics about weather, climate, the ocean, space, and much more. Our goal is to help you better understand the weather and to love it as much as we do. There's more to imagine when you listen. So let your imagination soar with Audible. Audible has audio titles from every genre that will inspire you to imagine new worlds, possibilities, and ways of thinking. As an Audible member, you get to choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog. Enjoy an exciting reawakening of a beloved classic with the Audible original, David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, produced by Academy Award-winning director Sam Mendes, starring Shudi Gatwa, Helena Bonham Carter, and Theo James. This adaptation breathes new life into a familiar tale. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash imagine or text imagine to 500 500. That's audible.com slash imagine or text imagine to 500 500. On Monday, September 2nd, 1935, the nation's first recorded Category 5 hurricane struck the Florida Keys with winds over 200 miles per hour. Its 15 foot storm surge washed away 30 miles of railroad that connected the islands to the mainland. On one of those rail cars, were hundreds of World War I veterans. Today I'm talking to two people that know this storm very well. Les Still is a broadcast meteorologist at WCTI in New Bern, North Carolina. He's also a huge train buff and a wealth of information about railroads. Les is going to take us through the history of the storm, sharing his weather expertise as well as his historical knowledge of Flagler's Railroad. And then I'll be talking to author Chanel Cleeton, Chanel is a New York Times and USA Today bestselling author. Many of her historical fiction novels have been selected for Reese Witherspoon's book club, including Next Year in Havana and When We Left Cuba. The book we're going to talk about today, though, is called The Last Train to Key West, and it takes place in the Florida Keys during the Labor Day storm of 1935. She'll tell us about her inspiration for this novel and explain the role both Cubans and American war veterans played during this time in the Keys. From understanding the dynamics of hurricane forecasting in the early 20th century to the socioeconomic and cultural implications during and after the storm, this episode will leave you with a comprehensive understanding of the infamous Labor Day hurricane of 1935. I want to start by asking you about your interest. You're a meteorologist, we know that, in North Carolina. But you also have kind of this interest in railroads, and this is a story where the two of these kind of come together. Can you tell me about that interest? Yeah, it's uh, one of those things that it all depends on where you grow up and the influence that you come under. And with me, I grew up in northeastern Maryland, uh, literally about a mile away from the northeast corridor, which connects, you know, New York to Washington. So you always had the Amtrak trains going there. And so I would fall asleep at night listening to the railroads, you know, going back and forth on the between Baltimore and, and Philadelphia. Okay, so let's talk about Flagler's Railroad and the history behind that. Can you give me a, a little background there? Well, to, to start talking about this, you have to go back and remember that, you know, 80 to 100 years ago, Florida was a completely different area than it is right now. It was hardly developed at all. So with Flagler... He went down to Florida, and like I said, Florida was kind of a, you know, a desolate place, was not really all that developed, with his second wife on his honeymoon, and he got hooked. His whole idea was he saw that there was the drive and desire to create luxury hotels down there. He started the northern area in Jacksonville, 
and worked his way down towards Miami. And then you layer into that aspect and around the turn of the 1900, he started hearing about the Panama Canal being built. So he started calculating this and started figuring, well, wait a minute. If you start to get the Panama Canal cutting through there, the, through the isthmus, then you're going to be having people coming to Key West. The natural thing would be that you extend that with a railroad up into the United States. So he started breaking ground on the railroad at about 1905, and it took him about seven years to actually get it connected. Keep in mind, it was horrible conditions. You were down in the swamp as far as the labor force was concerned. At one point, he had 4,000 men earning about $1.25 a day to slug it out there and with the mosquitoes and the alligators. So it was not nice working conditions to get this railroad built. But finally, he got it connected in about 1912. January 20th of 1912 was the first time they were actually able to run a train down from the Miami Homestead area into Key West. So the train's running, and then along comes this hurricane in yes. 1935. So can you take me through what it was like at that point, who was in the Keys, what the impact of this hurricane was? Well, and the interesting part about it is, is that during the construction there between 1905 and 1912, there were three hurricanes that hit them in the construction areas that were coming down through the Keys. In fact, I think it was the one in 1906 killed 125 of the workers. So they knew that this was a hazard. They knew that this potentially could happen. Interesting part about with the railroad and more importantly with this rescue train that got hit by the 1935 hurricane was it has to do with World War I. You had what they called this bonus army. These were veterans from World War I. 1929, the Great Depression hits. So they want to start collecting on their pension. The way that this bonus army was told that their pension would come was they would get a dollar twenty-five for every day that they spent out of the country in Europe, or a dollar every day that they spent here in country during the war. The problem was it wasn't supposed to be paid until 1945. So when the depression hit, these World War I soldiers decided, hey, look, we're gonna lobby to Congress to get our pension money. We need it at this point. So they kind of went back and forth with them. We got FDR uh, as far as the president was concerned. It was one of his, you know, New Deal work progress things that he decided that they were going to start building roads down in the Florida Keys. Even though the railroad was down there, you still had a lot of farmers, a lot of people visiting there, people that were coming down on the trains to these hotels and bungalows. They still needed to move around these islands. So they decided with this work progress project that they, they would send these bonus army World War I veterans down there. And at one time, there were about 700 vets down there in the Keys working on these work progress camp projects. Uh, usually they housed about, you know, anywhere between two to 300 people in these camps that were only about seven to nine feet above sea level. Okay, so they're, they're living in tents. Exactly. There's more people than usual in the Keys. So this is kind of the perfect storm. It's exactly what it is. So what happened next? Because in 1935, we didn't have radar. We weren't using satellites. This thing is coming. How do they know? Yeah, they, they started getting word like a day or two prior over in the Bahamas that, you know, a storm had come through. And a lot of people in the Keys, uh, they were a lot more weather aware just observing it than, than we are nowadays. They would watch the barometer. So when they started seeing the pressure starting to fall, that's when they knew, okay, it's time to, you know, put up the, the hurricane shelters and, you know, board up the windows, uh, you know, bring things up to higher ground. And again, we're not talking about, you know, very high above sea level here, maybe, you know, seven to nine feet. That's about it. Most of the houses and the buildings down there were. So as you got into September 2nd, that's when the, you know, the storm was really starting to head towards there that morning. They had actually sent a cable to Miami to say, hey, look, we need a rescue train to come down here to get these people from these camps. They were in Matacombe Key, 
which is where one of the bigger camps were. They made the call around noontime, but because the Florida East Coast Railroad by that point, because of the depression, had gone into receivership, there was a lot of paperwork they had to go through. They had some trouble getting uh, out of Miami to begin with, which is where their headquarters was located. The bridge over the Miami River was up. It was a holiday Monday. They couldn't get people there to get it taken care of. So really, the train did not leave until about 5.30 in the evening to even start its way down into the Keys. And by this point, the storm was making its full assault on the middle of the Keys. Do we know where exactly it made landfall? Isla Morada was the general area where this camp was. And then where the actual you know storm came across, there, there's a lot of Keys, small Keys is situated in there. Uh, but that's where the train was trying to get to. Matacombe Key was where this camp was. And it, it got as far as the Isle of Murata before the train actually got literally with a wall of water blown off the tracks. Yeah, there's actual pictures of this, which is amazing to me of this thing blown off the tracks. So what happened? Did not everyone on the train perish or uh, what was the outcome here? Quite, quite a few did perish. I, I've seen different numbers. I've seen anywhere between uh, 250, 270 people that were on the train. Uh, from what I, a lot of the things that I've read, practically everybody that had gotten on there, and a lot of it was the work, uh, the World War II or the World War I uh, uh, bonus army work is in campers there, but it was also just residents of the Keys down there. Because as the railroad, once it got down there in 1912, it served as the vital connection between the different keys across the area there. So from what I understand, the majority of the people that got on the train in the passenger cars, I think it was a 10-car train, it got completely wiped down. At one point, the engineer and the conductor and the fireman were huddling in the actual steam engine itself. Now, that thing was heavy enough that... and Anywhere between a 15 to 20 foot wall of water is what the engineer said, um, came and sideswiped the train. The engine was the only thing left standing on the tracks. All of the passenger cars themselves had gotten thrown off to the side. And from what I've heard, a lot of people that were in there, because obviously they didn't have seat belts, um, were basically swept out the windows and swept out into sea. And the majority of them perished. I know it was in 1935. This is We call it the Labor Day hurricane because we didn't even name hurricanes at that point. So what can you tell me about this particular hurricane? Uh, it, it was the strongest hurricane on record at that time to ever hit the United States. But uh, it would be a Category 5. And it's interesting. Um, there's a book written about this story, um, a historical fiction novel called The Last Train to Key West by Chanel Clayton. And... It literally was the last train to Key West this, you know, this time period. So why has this not, do you have an idea why we have, haven't have rebuilt this at all? Yeah, it was, it was basically, it, it, when it was completed, it was considered the eighth wonder of the world. However, a lot of the engineers didn't think that they were ever going to make this railroad. In fact, it was nicknamed Flagler's Folly because they were thought that he was just throwing money after money after money to try to get this thing made. When you look at it all in total, it cost back then between about 30 to 50 million dollars to complete this railroad. And about a year after it was completed, Flagler himself ended up dying. Uh, he died in 1913. The pr one of the problems was is that because we talked about that potential of Key West being that deep water port, the revenue never really materialized because as the powering of the steamship changed to oil. They didn't have to stop in Key West anymore. That's why then Miami became the bigger deep water port, bigger population. So really it was, first and foremost, it was the revenue before the Great Depression. And then once the Great Depression hit, money was very scarce. So because it would have cost so much to rebuild this, it was just way too cost prohibitive to be able to rebuild the railroad. So what they ended up doing was, they, in 1936, they ended up selling the right-of-way, as they call it, which was all of the remaining bridges, all of the remaining track, what was there, um, and the passage to the state of Florida. And that's what the state of Florida ended up making the first overseas road on the exact same bridges 
that Flagler had used for his railroad. I know that some of them have been rebuilt over the years, but so you're saying still when if you drive from Miami down to Key West across those Florida Keys, you're you driving still, over some of those original still railroads. see the exact same bridges that Flagler created that were still there. Do you remember that scene from True Lies back in the yes. 90s? Yes, that was, that I always was, think of that, the Seven Mile Bridge. Where that, they- that was the bridge that that was shot on. That was one of the original ones. Underneath the framework was the exact same bridges that Flegler had created for his railroad. Is there anything else you want to share about the Labor Day hurricane of 1935? Uh, I would say it, it was one of, uh, you know, the, the greatest storms to ever hit the coast, not only just for what it did in down there in the Keys, where it came in as a, a Category 5, it w- ran the entire coast of the United States. Uh, it, it developed near the Bahamas, went over to the Keys, then hooked around and came up through the Carolinas here and ran all the way up into New England before it finally exited. So now we have a pretty good idea of the science of the storm and the logistics of the railroad at the time. But I want to learn more about the people impacted by the storm. And for that, I'm talking to Chanel Clayton, author of The Last Train to Key West. I've read a number of Chanel's historical fiction novels, but this one by far is my favorite. So I was absolutely thrilled to get the insider info of how she prepared for writing a novel and how she gave voice to the people impacted by this storm. So Chanel Clayton, you wrote a book about a hurricane back in 1935, the Great Labor Day Hurricane of 1935, which a lot of people may not know about. This is before hurricanes were named. It was a long time ago, post-World War I. So I want to hear from you about where the idea came from for you to write about this topic. So I, like a lot of people, was previously unfamiliar with the storm. And I really um, first heard about it when Hurricane Irma was happening. So it was during the coverage. I was kind of watching it um, just to see, you know, I have a lot of family in Florida and friends and, you know, just kind of keeping an eye on things. And I came across this mention of uh, the Labor Day hurricane of 1935. And it was just really interesting because I grew up in Florida. You know, I'm originally from this state and it wasn't something I was familiar with. And then also... You know, I kind of, with being a writer, you know, you tend to find these really interesting moments in history. And I sort of mentally would be like, oh, that's something I might want to come back to, to to learn more about. And so when I kind of looked it up later on, I was really interested because I didn't know the whole story of the vets who had fought in World War One and had come back and were working on building the highway. And all of that um, was just so sobering. And I think also such an interesting component to the story. I mean, you have obviously the the natural disaster and the impact that it had on the region. But then you also have, you know, this really personal story of people who who fought in the war and kind of came home with a a host of problems as a result of that and really weren't taken care of the way they should have been. And so I was really just moved by the story and, and wanted to delve deeper into it. And that's when I knew, you know, I'd found the topic for my next book. So tell me about the research going into writing not only this book, but all of your books, I, I assume it's extensive. You have to become an expert in the topic, right? It, it definitely is. You know, with this particular event, there were a lot of congressional inquiries into the aftermath because um, there were definitely questions about the evacuation procedures, kind of the amount of notice that was given, how communication was filtered down. And so we had a lot of primary sources that you could draw from. Um, when I was doing the research, you know, there were a lot of interviews with people. Um, this was something definitely at the time that was very much at um, kind of the forefront of the public's attention and also, you know, had a lot of investigations done. So that was definitely useful. There's also been quite a bit of uh, nonfiction written about the event. So that's always a, a good starting point, I think, as well, to have those sources and to be able to kind of go into the record that way. And then also, you know, lots of photographs, um, basically, you know, documentaries that were done about it, you know, anything like on PBS that you can find. I mean, really, I try to find any source material I can that helps me to have a better understanding of, you know, whatever the event is that I'm studying. And then for me, particularly with this novel, it was really useful to go down to the keys because so much of the book and the plot of the book, you know, the the novel takes place over basically Labor Day weekend and then a little bit after that. And so it's on such a short time frame that I found my characters and movements were so dictated by the weather, by the conditions. You know, for example, the ferry uh, would stop, stopped running on a certain day. And so I couldn't get my characters from one point to another because it wouldn't have been possible 
because they had to stop the ferry because the weather conditions were deteriorating so much. So having that information and then being able to go myself and actually see, okay, you know, this is exactly where they would have been. And, you know, this is what the distance would feel like. And this is, um, they have actually markers down in the keys. If you're driving on the overseas highway, if you look, there are little markers that will tell you where the different veterans camps were. Um, So it was really, you know, powerful, I think, to be able to stand in those spots. There's a memorial in Isla Mirada that you can go to that talks about the hurricane and the aftermath. Um, So having that perspective definitely helps. And then also just driving the overseas highway and looking out and seeing the railroad. You know, you really get this kind of eerie sense of what an audacious audacious project it was, but also, you know, seeing its remnants and, and understanding how many lives were lost. It definitely had an impact. Did you talk to any meteorologists? I did not. And now that you said that would have been so interesting. No, I I wish I had, um, because honestly, you know, I think that was one of the things that was so illuminating to me. So I mentioned before, you know, I grew up in Florida and what was just so interesting to me was, you know, we fear hurricanes so much now, but you look at all of the modern technology we have, the warning systems, you know, the alerts, the fact that, you know, there's just so many more tools at our disposal and you still have, you know, storms wreaking havoc. But to read about back then, you know, how limited things were in terms of the information they were getting, you know, when they thought it was going to hit, it, it was fascinating. So it would have been really interesting to have a, a meteorologist perspective that is that is really interesting. It's cool because you think back in 1935, that's pre-satellite era. It's the data we have now, we have no excuse. We see it coming two weeks away. It was wild, kind of the misinformation and just the lack of information. Um, you know, I have a scene in the book where my characters are standing on a beach and there's a, a banner plane flying a banner that says storm warning. And that's, you know, literally how people were being notified. And then you had a lot of people looking at sort of the fishermen and people who, you know, worked the land and read the barometers and kind of asking them, well, what do you think? You know, what are you getting off of the readings? But they really didn't know, you know, what day it was going to hit. I mean, just we're not in a position to to have the tools to be able to evacuate. And then the decision to evacuate um, the veterans by train was made incredibly late, which, you know, unfortunately contributed as well to to what unfolded. I read an interview with you, and I know a lot of your books really draw in Cuban heritage and, and ancestry. And I, I didn't know that connection when it came to this railroad. Can you explain how that works? So I'm Cuban American and a lot of the the research and, and the books I write tends to kind of center on Cuban American relations. I just find it to be really interesting. And being from Florida, you know, anything that has that Florida connection, I think speaks to me as well. And so with the railroad, you know, it was really fascinating to learn that, you know, once you got to the Keys, this whole idea was to, you know, board the ferry and then go to Havana. And there was even talk of building, you know, the railroad out to go to Havana. And so it was kind of that cross-cultural connection again that I just found really interesting. So not only as a Floridian, but having that that Cuban connection. And at the time, I had written two other books um, about a fictional Cuban family that I had created. And so it was an opportunity to kind of take one of the characters from that family. We've sort of been following uh, the family throughout history in a lot of my books. And so I was able to put one of the characters in who's Cuban. She's just arrived from Havana on her honeymoon. And it's Labor Day weekend and she kind of ends up stuck in the Keys, you know, with her new husband um, when the storm comes. And it was interesting, too, because, you know, in that particular relationship, so the heroine's name is Mirta. Her husband's Anthony. He's American. He's from New York. She's um, Cuban, obviously. And it was really fascinating because their power dynamic throughout the book is very much kind of he's the one in control. You know, she's married him sort of with her family's wishes. There's a lot of political turmoil at Cuba at the time. And so... She kind of was not forced, but kind of pushed into this marriage. But when the hurricane comes or the Im- hurricane's like impending, he really starts to lean on her because she has experience with the storms and he doesn't really know what to do. And so you kind of see that role reversal a little bit. And that was interesting to kind of bore out in their relationship, realizing that, you know, in that she would have been the expert and he would have maybe been looking to her for guidance. Because if you haven't experienced hurricanes, you know, I think it definitely um, can be a daunting thing. Did you experience any hurricanes as a child? So I've definitely grown up through hurricanes and, you know, I've been fortunate enough not to have a direct hit, um, but I've done the whole, you know, do we evacuate, you know, the water everywhere, the bathtub's full and and all of that. And so writing about that tension, 
and kind of the fear and the watching and the waiting. Um, I tried to put some of, you know, my own experiences. Um, I was actually abroad when my family got hit. And so, you know, having that experience as well. Um, and I think just wanting people maybe who aren't from Florida to kind of understand a little bit of what that's like, because I think it's a little hard to understand, um, you know, until you're in this environment, what what it feels like when you're kind of I don't want to say helpless, but a little bit just sort of, you know, waiting to see if, if this huge destructive force is, is going to come toward you. It's really interesting. Your book draws in like three different things. So there's the science and the his- historical aspect, but there's also the social aspect, which I love about historical fiction is because you can't force us to be interested in the people normally when we're reading, you know, a nonfiction novel. But you're writing about people, they're fictional people, but it really makes us care about the situation. And that's a whole push with science right now is the social science aspect of it and understanding hurricane evacuations and different languages and making um, communication inclusive and talking about men versus women and how they handle things differently. So it's a really informative way to get that message across to people without just it being about science and history, which I love. It's, it's, it's very cool. I think Historical fiction has got to be one of the the coolest genres there is. It's really interesting, you know, definitely. I'm I'm drawn to these stories of kind of ordinary people living through extraordinary events. And, you know, this was such an example of that. And, you know, the thing I haven't really been talked about is in addition to all these other forces we have going on, you know, it's also the Great Depression. And so that plays a huge role in people's abilities, the impact that it's going to have on people, you know, when, I mean, homes were completely destroyed and carried away and, you know, the keys were forever altered. And so I think that also, that component of it was definitely something that I think had an impact on me. And I think a lot of readers maybe related to that as well. Was there anything you learned in the process of writing this book that really surprised you about either the event or about weather or about the history of it? You know, I think it was one of those things that I mean, as I mentioned, I wasn't familiar with it. And so not having that knowledge about a state that I felt like I knew pretty well, you know, the history, that was certainly interesting, especially because it is somewhat recent history. I mean, the 30s weren't that long ago when you think about the impact that it had on the Keys. Um, and then also, you know, it, it made sense, that, of course, that they wouldn't have had the technology we we have now. But I think knowing that intellectually and really seeing in practice what that would have meant for people's lives definitely um, was a disconnect. And it, it was really, like I said, sobering to kind of understand how difficult that must have been um, and and how frightening. And then, you know, just obviously the tragic loss that, that people had. I was also um, unfamiliar with the Bonus Army and the veterans. And so learning about their story was was certainly something that that was really an interesting point in context, because I think we hear so much about World War One, And, you know, so there's kind of this culture of, oh, there was so much respect for the people that fought. And, you know, you kind of thought that they came home to be seen as heroes to then learn that they were kind of pushed to the wayside um, was definitely, you know, a very sad and, and angry thing to, to learn. How long after Irma did you go to the Keys? So I went for research on this book in 2018 i believe so the following year yeah and it was still i mean still recovering places didn't have internet you know tons of blue tarps like you still definitely saw the effects and that too was really sobering because it was 2018 and you know you saw how much it took to recover and then you imagine what that would have been like in the 1930s um and i think that also kind of gave me a, a perspective of of the events in the book and trying to understand you know just how difficult and how um, kind of steep the hill to to recover that they they were facing. Um, are there any like looking down the road to future books? Are there any weather events that you've seen or um, you know natural disasters you've seen that you want to write about? That's a great question. I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but it's kind of like when I find it, I know, and then it's always like it gets stuck in my head, and then I'm like, okay, I have to write this. Like it, it won't let me go, and so I, I think it would be interesting. But it, as a writer, it was definitely a really unique experience because you're on such a short timeline, and then once again, how much the weather influenced my characters' movements was just fascinating to me. I mean, I had not written a book with that constraint, and so it was really interesting to go through that process. So I think if the the right story comes up again, then then that would definitely be a, a fascinating thing to work on. Awesome. Well, we want to hear about it and be a part of it. Impossible. <laughs> no, I, now that I know, I, I did not know a meteorologist now, but I definitely, that, that is amazing. No, I love 
Cool. All right, Chanel, that's all I have. This was amazing. I love hearing about your process. I'm a big fan. Um, I've read a bunch of your books. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. This was wonderful. Chanel's latest book release is called The Cuban Heiress. It's a fictional story set in 1934 on board a very real cruise ship called the SS Morro Castle, which if you haven't heard of, a simple Google search will tell you it ended in tragedy. I just read it. It's fantastic. All of her books are amazing. Off the Radar is a production of the National Weather Desk. Make sure you're following the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes publish every Tuesday. If you know anyone that loves weather, history, or historical fiction novels, please share this episode with them. Also, find us on social media. Our daily broadcast streams live there every weekday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern. Special thanks to Les Still and Chanel Clayton for joining me on this episode. I'm meteorologist Emily Gracie. Make it a great day.